Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes, and it is my great privilege to serve as the minister with this congregation, along with people of all ages and at all stages of life. We are an intentional community gathered around our shared promise to support each other's spiritual journeys. We welcome all, all gender identities, all sexual orientations, all colors, cultures, all abilities, politics, and theologies. We offer this welcome as a tangible expression of our values of compassion and courage, transcendence, transformation, justice, and service. As we come together for worship, we are mindful of the many people who have traveled here before us. We recognize and honor the Peoria people who created their lives on these lands long before we were here. This congregation is sustained by the care, talents, and generous gifts of our members and friends. If you'd like to make a financial gift, see the link in the chat or on the slide at the end of the service. And our effort to welcome extends to our guests and visitors who join us online. If you are new to this congregation, I invite you to help us get to know you. Uh, at the end of the service will be the link for our coffee hour after service on Sundays on Zoom. All are invited to the conversation. Please send a note to the church office if you'd like to get to know us even better. And our hymns come from a range of sources in Unitarian Universalism, Thank you to Sarah Dan Jones for permission to offer a meditation on breathing, and to Mary Pratt and Reverend Jim McGaw of the Unitarian Universalist Church of the South Hills in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for their performance. Thank you also to Paul and Susan Thompson and Sam Welch for their production of Now Let Us Sing. And I have one special announcement. I hope you have seen the notice of my installation with this congregation will be on March 21st at 3 p.m. Last May, this congregation voted to call me as the minister of this community, and I accepted. The installation is the formal ceremony that celebrates our new and growing ministry. And in the coming weeks, there'll be more information about how to participate. The service will be available for viewing on Zoom live with a mix of recorded elements live messages from various states around the country, and with a few people here in the sanctuary. The installation is a singular event. I hope you will join us. And now, let us enter into worship together. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of me. Ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again come. Come, come, whoever you are, wander at Opening words by Reverend Teresa Soto. Bring your broken hallelujah here. Bring the large one that is beyond repair. Bring the small one that is too soft to share. Bring your broken hallelujah here. 
I know that people have told you that before you can give, you have to get yourself together. They have overstated the value of perfection by a lot, or they forgot. You are the gift. We all bring some broken things, songs and dreams, and long lost hopes. But here and together, we reach within. As a community, we begin again. And from the pieces, we will build something new. There is work that only you can do. We wait for you. Our channel lighting today is from the Reverend Fuljanse Namadraji from the Unitarian Church of Burundi in Africa. When strangers meet, endless possibilities emerge. New experiences, new ways of understanding, and new ways of taking action. When strangers meet, each pays special attention to the other. Each is called to serve something larger than the self. Today, this morning, let's light the chalice for openness, for willingness to grow, for rich curiosity, and for common purpose. Good morning. Today I want to talk to you about community. Being a part of a family, a school, a nation, or a congregation can be a truly wonderful thing, but sometimes it can be hard to do too. Harmony is usually a bit more difficult to achieve than we think. Sometimes it's easy to forget that everyone has gifts and ideas to offer the group, not just us, and they're all needed to create beloved community. My story today is about one congregation that discovered that truth. It is called The Parts of the Church Argue. Once upon a time, there was a congregation gathered in their sanctuary one Sunday morning. Suddenly, without really thinking, they began to argue about who was the important member of the church, the very most important. First, the minister said, of course I'm the most important member. I'm your spiritual leader, and without my wonderful sermons, there would be no church. Then the choir disagreed and said they were obviously the most important members, that their music was the only reason people came on Sunday morning. Next, the RE director said, I know that without my programs, none of the families would even bother to attend. However, the teachers took issue and snapped that without their hard work, there would be no classes in RE. Well, said all the children, if we weren't here, there would be no classes to teach. And besides, we're the future. The board then cried out that they were in charge and without them, nothing would exist. Wait a minute, said the committee chairs. Without us, who would implement the board's ideas? Then the office chimed in about their importance, and then the architect snorted, oh, if I hadn't been so creative, there wouldn't even be a building to meet in. With the mention of the building, a low growl erupted from the bricks, and in a deep voice, the bricks declared, Excuse us, people, but this building is more important than any of you, and we are the most important. Without us, where would the minister stand on Sunday mornings, and what else would be the focal point for the service? Are you nuts? said the stained glass windows. We are the reason people are here. Nothing is more beautiful than us. Immediately, all of the windows then began arguing among themselves as to which one was the most beautiful. Oh, please, I'm what's important here, said Fellowship Hall. I'm where everyone gathers to visit and drink coffee, and everyone knows how important coffee is to you use. Well, said the bathrooms, with all that coffee, I think that makes us the most important part of the church. 
Then the walls, doors, chairs, flooring, and even the sanctuary's grand piano joined in. As they argued, they eventually realized that no one could win the argument, since they were all of great and equal value to the church. And at that moment, in one breath, the parts of the church proclaimed, none of us is important without the other, and we all need each other. And the quarreling between the members and the church ceased. With this new and important understanding, the congregation lived in peace and harmony from that day forward in beloved community. May our own church community, through its inevitable disputes and disagreements, move forward in peace and harmony as well, for that is the sacred work of living in beloved community. So be it. From George O'Dell, we need one another when we mourn and would be comforted, when we are in trouble and afraid, when we are in despair, in temptation, and need to be recalled to our best selves again. We need one another when we have come to die and would have gentle hands prepare us for the journey. All our lives, we are in need and others are in need of us. We offer our joys and sorrows within the embrace of this congregation because we know we need one another. For this week, in our congregational life, we offer our healing thoughts to Larry Miller, who is recovering at home following a hospital stay. And in our larger world, we offer our, our sympathy, our prayers, our thoughts to the South and particularly the state of Texas as they suffer from cold and power outages and the loss of water. The conditions in Texas have been deadly and indeed catastrophic. Let us offer our deep sympathy for all the lives ruined or lost while they simply try to survive. We offer our hopes for Texas, for the speedy return of all services, for the safety and health of everyone in the state. We offer our gratitude for every act of generosity and leadership. May those who make the decisions about care and recovery do so with wisdom and with regard to the needs of the human condition that have been revealed yet again in this time. If you need one specific way to help those in Texas, in addition to if you make a financial gift to the various agencies who are trying to help those in need. I offer this. Listen to their stories. The best way through trauma is to be heard. It is for pain to be acknowledged and for sorrow to be shared. If you have occasion to hear a story, pause and listen. That, that act of listening, of care, of compassion, those are real gifts and they make a real difference. Let us offer one more moment for all the joys and sorrows, the names and the milestones that are among us for there are so many. We share this quiet, this breath, and this time together. Amen. 
The reading for today is about the beloved community, as defined by the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., and as described at the King Center in Atlanta, Georgia. For Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., the beloved community was not a lofty utopian goal to be confused with the rapturous image of the peaceable kingdom where the lions and the lambs coexisted in idyllic harmony. Rather, the beloved community was for him a realistic, achievable goal that could be attained by a critical mass of people committed to and trained in the philosophy and methods of nonviolence. Dr. King's beloved community was not devoid of interpersonal group or international conflict. Instead, he recognized that conflict is an inevitable part of the human experience. But he believed that conflicts could be resolved peacefully and that adversaries could be reconciled through a mutual, determined commitment to nonviolence. No conflict, he believed, should result in violence. And all conflicts in the beloved community should end with reconciliation of adversaries cooperating together in a spirit of friendship and goodwill. As part of this month's theme on Beloved Community, I offer a reading from the Reverend Michael Slack and Alex Capitan. It's entitled, Beloved Community, What It Is and What It's Not, and it's part of their presentation on transgender inclusion in congregations. And they say, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of beloved community as the end goal of nonviolent boycotts. For King, beloved community was a goal to be achieved. It was a vision for how the world could be. And it really began with recognizing this notion that we are all different people who show up with different ideals, different values, different understandings about how the world works. We exist in the world in different ways. At the heart of King's work was the idea that when we get folks to actually sit down and be together, despite and in fact because of our differences, those differences can make us stronger and better as people. And so beloved community really is an ideal. It's not a thing that exists on its own. It relies on all of us coming together and engaging with deep conversation and communication and listening and understanding that we show up in different ways. Beloved community is not an enclave. There can be no beloved community if walls have been formed around that community because that's antithetical to the concept of beloved community. From a Unitarian Universalist place, beloved community is heaven here on earth. It's all life living in right relationship. And as long as there is an us and a them, there is no beloved community. Beloved community is when we say we, and we mean everyone. Beloved community is not homogeneous. When commonality is presumed, people, uh, we make assumptions about who's present and whether people are like us or not. We're not practicing beloved community because beloved community doesn't make those assumptions. Beloved community is not like-minded because we're not called to be like-minded in a spiritual community. We're called to be like-hearted. We don't have to think alike in order to build community together to practice love and compassion toward each other. And finally, Beloved community is not devoid of conflict when we avoid conflict in order to get along. We're not practicing beloved community because beloved community exists when we trust each other, when we have strong enough relationships to actually disagree with each other, to be in conflict, and even, and even to risk hurting each other and we can stay in relationship through all those disagreements and conflicts and potential hurt. That's 
practicing beloved community. Here ends the reading. And now our hymn, Meditation on Breathing. When you hear the word conflict, what comes to mind? When you hear the word conflict in beloved community or in a congregation, what comes to mind then? This is one of those sermons based in the understanding that every Sunday is a work in progress. Every week is made possible by our collaboration and how we learn from each other, no matter what our level of commitment to a liberal faith or experience in religious institutions or depth of theological reflection. This is one of those sermons that I wish we could do in person because sorting out the nature of conflict and its part in beloved community really is a mutual project, it is a chance to explore together and for me to ask a few questions of us along the way. While I share some notes about my skills or about my skills in development, if you will. Our theme this month is beloved community and it would be a disservice to ignore the presence of and role of conflict within us and among us. The service is today is merely a first chance to explore the nature of conflict and what to consider about it in this particular time and place. I have an additional motivation for touching on conflict in religious community uh, because in a month, we celebrate my installation as the minister of this congregation. This installation is the formal ceremony that completes the search processes you and I each started separately, getting on towards two years ago. And as we honor the ritual affirmation of our covenant together, it is worth naming that this is just the beginning of our ministry and everything that comes with commitment and covenant including how we understand conflict. When do we agree? When do we disagree? How do we disagree? And how do we find resolution and solutions? I'm going to tell you, we are all human, and conflict comes with the territory. When it comes to talking about conflict, one of the great teachers uh, that I learned from in my early ministry formation is the consultant Speed Lease. Uh, he talks about kinds of conflict, 
um, and has created one of the more known models for understanding this, uh, describing it with levels, including uh, level one, the conflict is a problem to solve, uh, that you have conflicting goals and values and needs, and you're problem-oriented. That level two would be disagreement. You might, in that case, you have a mix of personality and problem, and it's a little harder to define which is which. Level three is more getting towards a contest, uh, win-lose dynamics, if you will. And it's a little harder to see what the problem actually might be. Um, level four gets into fight and flight and so on. Now, what usually comes up in congregational life are in the world of level one, level two, sometimes three, hopefully not four, and definitely, hopefully not five. The higher the level, the more the conflict is about identity and position rather than a problem to solve. Uh, more about uh, the higher levels of conflict are more about identity and perceived us and them that lead to more intractable positions. A speed lease also named another level, which is zero, when an institution doesn't realize there is conflict at all. Uh, in that case, he describes it as a form of depression. Now, with these levels of conflict, he was uh, always had the goal to move people to as low a level as possible uh, until they could get to level one and look at a problem together. And what he and all of the other wise consulting people I've heard and read say is that conflict is not to be avoided. It is, in fact, inherent in our lived experience as individuals and as part of organizations, any organization. And in fact, the presence of conflict at any level and the practice of addressing it is essential to how we develop our communities, whether they're religious or secular or our families, in fact. Any gathering of people, that what we develop out of how we handle conflict, as well as the questions themselves, the content of the conflicts, are all part of how we grow and how we emerge and how we move forward creating new and uh, new, discover new paths together. Now, Dr. King understood the ever-present nature of conflict and the worthiness of nonviolence when approaching uh, disagreement. You really want to try to keep bringing people together, uh, knowing about these profound differences between us. But it was still important to keep bringing people together. Uh, from our other reading, Alex and Reverend Michael apply King's understanding uh, to describing the beloved community and Unitarian Universalism. We create heaven and earth here and now. We are stronger when we gather together fully aware and articulate about our respective identities. And here's the key, being willing to listen and get to know what each of us finds is holy to be of worth and what it means for how to conduct our mortal lives. This is the work we do in our congregation, in every meeting, in every small group, and every time we get together and have coffee as part of our congregational life. This is the practice. Author Bell Hooks, uh, Bell Hooks tells us that beloved community is not formed by the eradication of difference, but by its affirmation by each of us claiming the identities and cultural legacies that shape who we are and how we live in the world. Now, so uh, talking about what shapes us, let me offer a little glimpse, a little insight into some of what I know shapes me, because this is also part of the practice is in engaging with conflict is to know where each of us comes from. Um, now, I know that in my style, in what I have learned by nature and from nurture, as some deep, deep groundedness and conflict avoidance, I'm just gonna say, uh, I love to get along with people. I'd really rather get along with people. And 
I learned this well from growing up in New England in a white, Protestant, middle-class family. I have deep skill at delay, uh, both individually and culturally, waiting to let something slide and doing a decent imitation of letting something go. Although kind of, but not really actually, letting something go. And this is deep enough that I am still working on how to interpret and articulate my feelings. But knowing, knowing that this is part of where I come from and part of who I am, it makes a difference in how I do everything. And sometimes, and sometimes it even helps me in a conflicted moment during the moment rather than afterwards when I'm kicking myself uh, for making nice. And I'm here to tell you that uh, Unitarian Universalists have also inherited a lot of these same challenges from long established white Protestant culture. If you hadn't known this before, I'm telling you now. Uh, and so much in our communities, in our lives, is also done well. Um, so let me affirm that as much as we've inherited some challenges with dealing with conflict and an unwillingness to it culturally, uh, we also manage these things so well. This is partially why I am here with you, because I so appreciate what everybody in this congregation tries to create together and to resolve concerns, to speak honestly and with care, and to keep trying and trying again. Um, Speedlease reminds us that it's so important and valuable to keep conflict productive and to not avoid it as much as possible to take care of the concerns that are before us. You know, one of the things I know I do uh, is try, do my best to pause and act and, um, and ask, I should say, what is going on? What is happening in the room? What is happening with me? Where am I in the conversation? Am I actually in it or am I mentally running away? Because I just don't want to be here. What do I need to do right now to take care and do my best to be present for what is around me and what is important to me and what do I need? It is so important, I find, in my own practice to listen to my body. Am I relaxed? Am I present? Am I cold? Am I uncomfortable? And why? What? is leading me to be in the place where I am, however my state of being might be. Now, I've mentioned the dirty dancing approach to self-differentiation, you know, that this is my dance space and that is your dance space. And in moments of conflict, how am I aware of my space, how I am moving and being? And what can I do to take better care in any particular moment? So that's one approach to thinking about conflict. The other I want to focus on is to stay curious. I have a story from the book Getting to Yes from Roger Fisher and William Urry. Once in a beautiful, prominent hotel, there were two chefs who were preparing a feast. And in that kitchen, there was only one orange left. And these two esteemed, supposedly adult, Chefs were fighting over it. You know, I need that orange. Yes, but I need that orange as well. And time was running out, and they both needed an orange to finish their particular recipes for the president's dinner. So they decided on a compromise. One of them grabbed a large kitchen knife, chopped the orange in half, and each went to their separate end of the kitchen to finish the meal. And one chef squeezed the orange uh, juice and poured it into the special sauce. It wasn't quite enough, but it would do. The other grated the peel and stirred the scrapings 
from that into the batter for his famous cake. He didn't have quite what he needed either, but what else was he going to do? And there was a point at which they realized what each of them had done and what they had actually needed. And for each of them, it was a long and terrible feeling when they recognized what could have been, what could have been if there had been a question, a wondering, an inquiry, rather than having this loss of opportunity and lament that loss. In conflict, we can get so bogged down with false urgency, with fear of loss, of separation. And sometimes we have come by those fears and that urgency from real, honest, and true experience. We come to these fears uh, truly and authentically. And if we can remain curious, ask questions, wonder out loud, explore the ideas that come, no matter what we think their worth might be, we can find solutions and options and possibilities beyond what might be right in front of us. Curiosity is the way to stay connected, to get and be proximate, as Brian Stevenson tells us, to be in relationship. Now, by all means, there are moments to leave and to stop and to separate, and sometimes that is essential for our health and well-being. And not all ideas or positions or values or identities have the same value either. I'm not saying that. This is not, you know, equalizing everything for the sake of unity. But staying curious can be a reminder of our humanity, our individuality and somebody else's individuality, and not taking ourselves or others for granted. There's been so much loss in this past year that lives in our hearts. Some of the people that we have lost we know directly, and some we know this loss because of our common humanity, um, such as feeling for those who have been suffering in Texas. I think curiosity in the midst of conflict reminds me why I'm here in the first place, why you are here. Not because what we do in congregational life is easy, although there are so many moments of celebration and ease and joy and gratitude. But we are together, and together we are stronger, and in that strength we have more hope and more of a future. One of the most important lessons from dismantling white supremacy that I have been learning is how much we get wrapped around the axle of anxiety and fear and then nothing gets addressed and it just gets only worse. But maybe we can let curiosity and its willingness to interrupt a moment and ask a question and wonder out loud to try something different other than what has gone before. Within beloved community, with its practice of conflict, its constant exercise, we learn about ourselves and others. We inquire, rather than assume, we remain, rather than flee. And as we go forth into the world, may we be so bold and so willing to engage with each other with our differences present and around us, and with a renewed commitment to understanding, we might, we might just make a difference in the day to come. So may we be. Amen. Sing, 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 lift up.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. From the Reverend Rebecca Savage. Spirit of life, spirit of love, we have gathered under the banner of a shared faith. We are born of a welcoming grace that extends and receives love, and we are touched by the ways we have fallen short of who we strive to be. Here, we are reborn, forged by a greater courage. And so let us move forth from this place, encouraged and refreshed for this journey that is before us and that is all around us. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs> 